Okay, so we're going to talk about two trees, two kingdoms in the next four weeks. And But before that, we're going to talk about my grandbabies. <laughs> five, three of my five grandbabies. Um, and so I just thought this picture kind of represented what we're going to be talking about. And then I wanted to see their faces because we're going to be um, using an illustration from the time we were there. But, okay, so Cassie made this cute little plate. And, and it's for Duke. And you can see that he's, like, super excited. But can you see the girls? I'm sure they were told to smile. But can't you see him kind of going, like, where's ours? <laughs> why Duke? Why not us? You know, they're a little worried and a little happy at the same time. Well, when we were there recently, um, at Blakely, so this is Blakely and this is Autumn. Um, Blakely's three and a half, and almost four actually, and she won she was eating something and she needed a napkin. So she hollers out, somebody bring me a napkin! And so the Autumn was with me in the kitchen and I said, Autumn, would you please take Blakely a napkin? And I tore off a paper towel. And Autumn's all smiley. She's excited to help. And so she marches in there and hands Blakely the napkin. And as soon as it exchanged hands, she started weeping and bawling. Like she had just given away the most valuable thing that existed on the earth. And she may never, ever, ever have the opportunity to have another paper towel. And, and it was just like this remorse and regret. And I shared it. And will I ever have it back? And just this sense of lack, and I would just go, Autumn, there's more, Autumn, there's more, and she was just beside herself as a typical two-year-old, just distraught in her emotions, and the whole situation was just hopeless, and so finally I just stopped talking to her, and I went into the kitchen, and I got another napkin, or a paper towel, and I handed it to her, and I said, is this what you're looking for? And she goes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, and moves on. It did not, I could not break through her emotions. Like with my words, I could not break through her emotions. And it wasn't until I presented it to her that she was like, oh, okay, there's more. I'm not in lack. And, and so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, um, is this idea that the enemy presents us these opportunities every day, multiple times a day, to think that we're in lack. And what Adam didn't realize was that in the pantry were paper towels in abundance, right? They were everywhere. And, and, and she didn't have to be in lack. But in that moment, she was inspired. The enemy wanted to write something on this paper towel. Lack, fear of missing out, jealousy, comparison, regret. I mean, these are all the things that the enemy wanted to convince her were true. Right? But in reality, there was a whole huge would you hold one into that? There was a whole huge group of paper towels available to her. Aww. And, That's so cool. and they had there was no limit. No limit to what she had access to. Like it was all there. She just couldn't see it. Right? And so there is just so much available to us that we just can't necessarily see right away. But we have to learn how to shift out of this immediate reaction of lack and fear and anxiety and comparison and jealousy and all of these things. And we have to be able to shift and say, wait a minute, if God's good, then there's no lack here. So where's his goodness? So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm just going to leave this here. And I, I like the paper towel example because I was really glad that God did that because we all use paper towels a lot. <laughs> and so it's a good way for us to keep in mind and be remembered. Um, okay, so where did this come from? It came from Genesis. So we're going to go back into Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to go back to the beginning. And we are going to learn the strategy of the enemy to keep us feeling like we're in line. And then, after this week, we're going to be talking about how to shift out of that. But we are going to learn about what our enemy does. Okay. So, I'm going to skip the part of how God created the world. But, just for you to know, he created it by his word. And... The Holy Spirit was hovering, right, over the face of the earth. 
And he was just like, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? And so as he spoke it, the Holy Spirit was like, Boom, let's make it. And so Jesus was there. We know that from the word. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together partnered to create the earth. They spoke it into existence until they got to man. And man was a very unique form, a creation of God. And so does anybody remember how God made man? From the, the dirt of the earth that he had already created. So we're going to start in Genesis 126. Let us make man, let us make human beings, this is the New Living Translation, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So I want you to notice some things that are different about man than all the other creation. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in, in, the, in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And then God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. So that's why Daniel fast is so effective. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. Isn't it nice that when he created all the animals and stuff, he didn't expect man to feed them all? <laughs> he took care of that. I was like, that was really good, God. Then God looked over all that he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust, and now I'm in Genesis 2, sorry, skipped over, Genesis 2, 7 through 9, and a few verses in there. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So just imagine that for a second. So all the other creation is done, and now he's starting to just dig uh, go down into the soil. It reminds me when Jesus leaned down and he's writing in the soil. So like he's going into the soil. Maybe he's making an outline. Who knows? We don't really know. But we know from the Bible that the angels were like, what is he doing? What is this thing called man? We don't know what he's up to. And so can you imagine he's digging in there and he's got this clay and he's sculpting him and and the angels are like, what is it? What is this going to be? And he gets farther and farther along, and they're like, oh, my goodness, it looks just like him. Like, what is this thing that he's making? And they just didn't have any understanding of it. And so he is literally with his own hands sculpting his own image and making it look like him. And, I mean, I think the angels just must have been astounded. I also sometimes wonder if that's what really ticked Satan off, you know? <laughs> what? Um, but anyway, he, he breathes his life. It's the only creation that God literally breathed his life into that thing and caused it to become a living person. The rest of them, you know, rest of creation, it says, you know, just be, and it was there. And it was flying and swimming and scurrying and all of the things. But man was the only one he breathed his life into. So then the Lord planted, and this is verse 8, the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful, produced delicious fruit. But in the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God placed the man in the garden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely from every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. So let's just highlight real quickly some things that were different about man, formed by God's own hand, formed in his image, the breath of life. He had several assignments. Did you catch all the assignments in that passage? He was supposed to have dominion and reign over all the earth and the animals in it. He was supposed to, this is later, we didn't read this part, but he got to name all the animals. I heard something one time that talked about the naming of the animals, that there was, that some of, this is a Hebrew tradition, so it's not biblical necessarily, but a Hebrew tradition is that the animals were sort of in a, a partial state of creation, and that as Adam named them, they became fully who they were intended to be, which is interesting. It's like, a, it was like a co-creator role. 
Um, they are to be fruitful, reproduce, and fill the earth. They are to multiply. So in other words, whatever they, what they touch is supposed to increase. They're supposed to create increase and blessing on the earth. They're only species on earth that co-creates with God. Um, tend the garden. They had no covering. They were naked. You know, there was fur on animals and feathers on birds and scales on fish, but they were naked. Walked and talked with God with no fear. And they had access to everything that God had put there except for one tree. So, let's, I'm going to show you a video real quick. I'm going to have to switch my cable here to do it. But, um, there is, how many of you guys have watched the Bible Project ever? A few, not very many. So this will be a treat. Are there some things that stood out to you? Interactive class. Uh, the one statement I think will stick with me is taking authority to do what is good in their own either eyes or ways. I didn't catch it all, but I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. That's profound. It is. And and what's it was like? I think it's is it the last verse of the Old Testament. It said. And everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And then there was 400 years of silence <laughs> before Jesus came to the earth. And the other state. Can you say what he said? Yes, I can. So Scott said this, the phrase that stuck out, struck out to him, stuck out to him was just the idea of every man that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, basically eating that fruit, is saying everyone's just doing what's right in their own eyes. That's what that really is. And we'll that fruit. One of the phrases that stood out to me was, we have to learn a new way of being human. And if I was going to sum up what I want to focus on in the next four weeks, is a different way of being human. And Jesus demonstrated it for us, so we have a really good example. But he was not human like any other human. He was a human that was filled with the Holy Spirit that was directly connected with his father, who only did what he saw his father doing and said what he heard his father saying. That is a completely different way of being human because not once did Jesus do or say what was right in his own eyes. He only did or said what was right in the father's eyes. So, um, all right, so they have a choice. They only have one rule, one rule. <laughs> Don't eat from the one tree. So one thing I want to emphasize is everything else that God had created was a yes. Like God is full of yeses. Whenever we see this, this little no, 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 we have to switch. We have to find a different way of being human and switch our emphasis to all of God's yeses. If you go on a diet and you make your no list, you are going to fail immediately. If you make your yes list, you will succeed. My brother-in-law told this story. They would walk home from school, and they would pass this guy. We all know him. We all have one in our neighborhood, probably the one whose lawn is you know, just meticulous. And it's just perfect. And they never bothered it. It never even just was on their radar until he put a sign out that said, do not touch the grass. <laughs> and then all they wanted to do was touch that grass. <laughs> So that's what the enemy, he wants us to get us focused on what was God's no to you again? And, and if he can get us to focus on a no instead of on the yeses, he's going to have us. So let's look at his tactics. So first of all, we just need to know that God put two trees there and, and we have a choice to make. Um, so we know that the tree of life brings eternal life, that it is a representation of God's view and opinion. It's, it's the eternal life, it's the very, the zoe life, which zoe means the very life that God himself enjoys. It represents that. And also they touched on it there, but not in detail, that the word tree and vine are synonymous. And it's either in the Hebrew or Greek, it means the same thing. So whenever you talk, hear Jesus talking about vines, that's the word for tree. Whenever we say a tree, that's the word for vine. So keep that in mind as well. Okay. So God has an enemy, right? We all know that. And I don't know when this whole thing, I just, I like to imagine. Like, was it when he was forming Adam that he was like, wait a minute, I'm not serving that thing. That thing's going to serve me. I don't know. I don't know when all this happened. 
But we know that, that um, Satan fell, and he wanted the worship that God was getting. He wanted the dominion that God had given man. <coughs> he wanted the authority that God had given man. And in Ezekiel, it says, how, are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. And there's another verse, and I meant to grab that one, but it basically says, you were in Eden. He says, you were in Eden. And so we know that from the story, of course. Um, and then the verse that, um, in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to <coughs> destruction, death, right? So the enemy will lose, but he wants to take as many of God's highest creation with him. So what is his strategy? Okay, so in the garden, we're going to read Genesis 3, 1 through 6. I thought I had it in here, but I do not. All right. I'm going to let you read it because I didn't have it in here. Oh, I have ESV. English standard version. Oh, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was <laughs> Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some, of her, some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Okay, so there's a lot in there that we need to understand, because this is the strategy of the enemy, right? What we just heard is the strategy of the enemy, and he hasn't changed. He's not very creative. He hasn't really upped his technique <laughs> in centuries. So the first thing we see is he, he says, did God really say? He's going to challenge us. Are you sure you heard God? Are you sure that's what he said? Are you sure that's what he meant? And so he's going to, first, the first thing he wants to do is cast a doubt in our minds that we really don't understand what God said and what he meant. And I would say, in a, that's the first place, is to question the word. And then he also, you know, he's very crafty. He can put a little word in there. Well, what does that really mean? You know, maybe he meant this, maybe he meant that. And instead of going to God and asking him, what do we do? We start swirling it around in our own understanding. And we start doing it in our head, and we think pros, cons, right, wrong. And we try to figure it out instead of just going to the Lord and saying, well, what did you mean? Can you imagine if after this little discourse, Eve, instead of eating from the tree, she just said, you know what? God's going to be here later. Let me check with him about this. <laughs> I mean, that would have totally changed history, right? Okay, so then he says, did he really say you can't eat from any of these trees? Is that what God said? No. So he's always exaggerating God's harshness. God said don't eat from one tree, right? And so he exaggerates it and says, oh, it's probably not just that one tree. It's probably all these trees that you should stay away from. Have you ever noticed that? Satan's always wanting to take, even if we found liberty in a particular area, he's like, oh, you know, God doesn't want you to have freedom there. No, no, no. you got to put all these boundaries around yourself because God is much harsher than you think he is. And so he's always trying to get us to believe God's intention is harshness. And then he said, and then what does Eve respond, by the way? Does, did Eve get it right, what God said? No. What did she add? You 
can't even touch it. We are, yeah, we can eat from all the trees except for that one. We can't even touch that one or we'll die. Well, that's not what God said. So that was the first religion, right? <laughs> religion entered the world right then. We added to what God said. That's what religion is. And then he says, you won't die. So he literally takes on God, what God has said and says he's a liar. So he calls God a liar. Gosh, we see that everywhere today, right? You're a female. Oh, no, you're not. You're a male. Oh, no, you're not. God made you in his image. Oh, no, he didn't. You know, I, I think it's fascinating that in the homosexual movement, you know, they can say, I was born this way. I can't change. But in the gender confusion movement, they say, well, I don't know how I was born. I have to change. And it's like, which side of this do you want to fall on? Well, the side that means, you know, that makes you feel better about your own understanding. Um, and then he says, you're, you're, you won't die. You'll be like God. Well, guess what? They already were, right? They already were like God. So that was an attack on their identity. That was an attack on whether they are qualified to be like God. So that the, the enemy is always going to attack us in this area of sort of identity and who we are. Like what God has said about us. What God has planned for us. You won't be, you're going to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. Well, guess what? He does want you to be like him. And, but the enemy will always tell you, you're not qualified to be like him yet. But I have your qualifications. I have the way you can get qualified. And you'll know for yourself what is good and evil. From what is good, you'll know good from evil. So they already knew good, right? They had been experienced only good. And the enemy is like, oh yeah, but you don't know evil yet. That's my language. And I would like you to know that too. And I think you'll want to know what I have to say. So he's basically opening their eyes and their doubts to whether or not they want to know both sides of the story. And it's interesting, you know, there's this phrase that says, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. I think that's a lie. I think that's a lie. A lie. Because basically that's where Adam and Eve were. They were so heavenly minded, they didn't even know what evil was. They had no concept of it. They were naked and not ashamed. They had no concept of evil. And the enemy's like, oh no, you're going to want to know about evil. It'll help you, I'm sure. It doesn't help us. Okay, so once he had in their mind the doubt, then he got his fo their focus on what they could see. So now Eve's looking at the tree. Oh, it does look good. It does look tempting. It looks like it's got good nutrition in there. <laughs> she even talks about, oh, it's nutritional, I'm sure. And so she's looking at it, and she's like, oh, it looks, it's looking pretty enticing. I think what he's saying is making sense to me, right? I'm not going to listen anymore to my, what Spirit, Holy Spirit, what God has said. I'm going to say, what makes sense to me? And so she reaches out. And this is what's interesting. Adam's right there, right? God is the one. God told Adam, you're supposed to watch over this whole situation here. And he sits there and watches Eve take this fruit. Now, what does, has God said is going to happen? She's going to die, right? And he's just sitting there watching her. Like, well, let's see what happens. And so she takes it, she eats, and she doesn't immediately die. And actually, there's no, nothing happening different at that moment. And so she gives it to Adam, and then he takes the, the, the bite because he was the one that had the responsibility. He was the one that God gave that responsibility to, to protect that tree or to not eat of that tree. As soon as Adam takes the bite, everything changes. Everything changes, and they begin to experience this fear anxiety, shame, intimidation, jealousy, um, comparison, blaming, all of those things begin to happen. Um, <clears throat> so what causes us to be, what caused them? I was just asking, I was like, God, why did they fall for it? What did they not understand? I don't know, we have no idea how long they were in the garden before this happened. But what did they not understand? Why was this tempting? Because whatever it was they didn't understand, we probably need to understand. And so here's some things that the Lord told me, but I would be curious to hear if you guys come up with any others. They didn't grasp what they had been given. 
right? They didn't understand what God had given them. They didn't understand the majesty and the beauty of what God had placed in front of them. They, and they didn't grasp their assignment. And it makes me think about how sometimes maybe we kind of have an inkling of what our assignment is and we want to just speed ahead. And my guess is God was going to groom them into their larger assignment. He started with just a garden, right? But this garden is supposed to fill the earth with his, with his glory. So he didn't start with the whole earth. He started with a plot. And sometimes I think we think, well, I know what my assignment is, so I'm ready for the big times, or I'm ready for, to go. And God's like grooming us. So I don't think they totally grasped their assignment was to literally fill the earth. They didn't grasp the generational consequences of their decision. And I think that happens with us a lot too. We don't realize that what the things that we are choosing every day are having generational consequence, consequences. They focused on their own opinion, which was based on their own understanding, and they focused on their five senses. So they let their five senses start to rule them. Oh, it looks good. Oh, I think it will taste good. And their emotions. Oh, I feel FOMO. I think I'm missing out on something. And they weren't willing to walk in humility to let God um, develop them. <clears throat> so every day and in every way, we are making a choice of which tree we're going to eat of. We're making a choice as to whether we're going to believe God and what he says about us and what he says about our assignment and what he says about the generations that are going to follow us and what he says about how we are created in his image and that we are qualified and we are just like him. We are co-creators and we are partners and we're going to walk side by side. He's going to tell us and give us everything we need as we need it. That's one tree. Or, God, are you here? What did you say? Am I qualified? Am I like you? Do we have a partnership? Do you love me? All of those doubts. Are you who you say you are? Are you good? When it comes down to it, in my life, and my walk with Christ, it's like, God, remind me again how good you are. I need to be reminded again. When I get stuck every time, it's because I am, I am not trusting that God is as good as he says he is, and there's more goodness that he wants to unveil to me. <clears throat> So as I was preparing for this lesson, the phrase get coming out in the next passage, so when they eat and then, um, well, let's just read that real quick. So Genesis 3, 7 through 13. At the moment that Adam ate, their eyes were open. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So this was like, they already knew what he sounded like. They, it was just a familiar thing. They were used to hearing God walk about in the garden. And, oh, there he is. So they hid from the Lord among the trees, and then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he replied, I, We heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked, Have you eaten from the true tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? So most of my, not most, a lot of my Christian life I've heard, well, Adam and Eve were clothed in the glory and they were clothed in the light. And I would imagine that would somewhat be true because Moses went up to the top of the mountain. He wasn't, you know, he was an imperfect man, for sure, and when he would come down, the glory on his face was so strong that everybody was like, cover your face, it's too much for us. So because they were in the presence of God, they would reflect his glory like the moon reflects the sun. But, but they were naked. And this phrase, God just kept highlighting, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? And so the implication is, God already knew they were naked. They didn't. <laughs> you know, God already saw them as naked. So what is naked? When you think of the word naked, what, is, what are some words that come to mind? Unclothed. Unclothed. Transparent. Transparent. Exposed. Vulnerable. Vulnerable. Anything else? Like nothing's hiding, right? You can't hide anything. It is what it is. 
So they were in this place, y'all have probably been around a toddler who gets out of the bathtub and they have like no shame of their nakedness and they're like running around the house, they don't want to put clothes on, you know, like that's where they were at. Like they had no awareness that this was not a good thing. So I'm going to throw out some Sherilyn ideas and you can totally challenge me on them. Um, what causes us to... So one of the things, what causes us to feel shame? So there was only one rule in the garden, right? Only one. Until they broke that rule, they felt no shame. So it was actually the law, the, the one law that they disobeyed that brought shame and exposed their nakedness. So my question to God was, you know, I've always kind of assumed Adam and Eve were without sin. Because there was only one law and they didn't break it. So therefore they're without sin, right? But as we define sin now with the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, thou, no commit of adultery. Well, when you look at what's happening with Adam and Eve and the serpent, um, there's, some law, there's some what we would call laws, some sin that we would now say is sin, but God didn't call it sin back then. You know, he said, don't have any other gods before me. Well, here they are inviting in this other one who wants to be a god instead of them. He said, don't covet, but yet they're coveting the tree. Later, he says, don't steal, but they're stealing from this tree. He says, don't murder, but Adam's watching like, hmm, I wonder how this is going to turn out. She might die. <laughs> they said, he says, honor your father and mother. So it's not like Adam and Eve were this like perfect sinless beings in our definition of the word. By God's definition, yes. But for later definitions, they were doing these things. They already had these things in their heart. So I guess the thing that struck me about that was they were naked and unashamed, even though these things were already in their heart. And Jesus became a curse so that we could become his righteousness. And part of that restoration is realizing that when Jesus covers our sin, he became our sin, he paid for our sin, he wiped out our sin, that is what allows us to become naked and unashamed before him. To come boldly before the throne of grace. It's not because we don't sin and we don't still have things in our heart. It's because of the state that he put us in. He put Adam and Eve in a state of sinlessness because there was only one rule. And because of that, they could come naked and unashamed to him. And he puts us, through Christ, he puts us in a state of sinlessness, of our sin not being counted against us. And so because of that, we can come naked and unashamed to him. And it's authentic, it's exposed, it's raw, it's nothing hiding, it's not playing games. But if you think about that toddler, it can be full of joy. <laughs> you know, it can be this... I am accepted. I am loved just as I am. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but to me it was like God's approval of them was not based on this, these hearts that were perfect toward him because those hearts betrayed him, high treason against him, and yet they were not ashamed at all until that law came in. So it shows you the power of the law to hurt our conscience and to hurt our relationship with God. Okay, so we are going to look at the promise that God made, and this is in um, chapter 3, verse 12. So paradise was given and paradise was lost, but we are looking forward to paradise restored. So the man replied, so God's like, have you eaten from the tree? And he says, ah, it was that woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. And then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? Well, the serpent deceived me. So here we have the blaming and the shaming. That's why I ate it. So now they have this fear, this lack, this insecurity, this blame, the shame, comparison, regret, distance from God, broken relationships, loss. All of this in that moment enters. And then from this time on until Christ, sin began to rule as the loudest voice in most humans. Our nakedness was covered, and through the Ten Commandments were known, though, though they weren't yet known, um, they were being broken daily. By the time Noah came along, 
The Bible says every thought of man's heart was evil. And then, you know, right at the end of the Old Testament, every thought was of their own understanding. What They, they did what was seen best to them. But God had some very good news. So in 3.14, Then God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals. You crawl on your belly. I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your <coughs> offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head. So the woman's offspring will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And then he says, look, in verse 22, the humans have come, become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. And so he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way back to the tree of life. So that's paradise lost, but it's also paradise promise of how it will be restored. So in paradise restored, in Hebrews 4, 13 through 16, it says, Nothing in all creation. So it's important to know, back up, it's important to know that God knew all this was going to happen. Because it says, before the foundation of the world, the Godhead got together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're like, okay, we want a family, we want partners, we want co-creators, we want to destroy the rebellion of the enemy. We can do that on our own, but it'll be more fun if we have more family members involved. The other thing about choice that the Lord's been showing me, we all, hopefully we all know that without choice, there can be no love, right? You can't have love. If I say, you have to love me, then that's not love. <laughs> you have to have choice to have love. So we know that God wanted choice. When that God has meeting in their little, you know, pre-planning strategy session like okay we want a family but we really want them to choose us so there's going to have to be something else they could choose besides us otherwise there's no choice so there is going to have to be an antagonist here there's going to have to be something else they could choose but we know they're going to choose wrong so we're going to have to have another plan in place for the choice that they make that is wrong to be totally corrected in a way that doesn't compromise our holiness, and then that will be another choice that they get to make. And if they make that choice, it'll overrule the other choice. Like, I mean, can you imagine the conversation? And then there would be like, okay, well that's gonna, if we give this authority to man, then the only way that the choice can be overwritten is by a man. And so somebody's gonna have to go down there as a man, and empty their godness and live like a man. And Jesus is like, I'll do it. You know? So this happened before they even created the earth. And so they have this plan already in police. They know all of this is going to happen. And so in some ways Satan is, you know, doing what he his role is to do by giving us these choices. But the other thing the Lord told me about choice is without choice, there is no indication of loyalty. And without loyalty, without a demonstration of loyalty, there is no reward. So it's not just about love, it's about reward. Because God says, those who seek him must believe he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who choose him. So without this choice that is in front of us every day, multiple times a day, right? There is no love, there is no loyalty, and there is no reward. So every day, that's why God says, seek first the kingdom of God, you're gonna, there's going to be rewards, there's going to be treasures, put your treasures in heaven. So in Hebrews 13, it said, or 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. We're all naked, whether we want to admit it or not, we're all naked. <laughs> Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are all accountable. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven now, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. For this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. We don't have to pretend they don't exist. We don't have to hide them. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there will we, re we will receive his mercy, and there we will find help for us when we need it most. 
So this is kind of a picture of the new way to be human, right? Jesus gave us a new way to be human. He's like, and I demonstrated it for you. I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to show you how to connect with the tree of life. Because the thing that was amazing, so y'all know what a pawn shop is, right? I don't, I need money, so I take my wedding ring, take it to the pawn shop. They give me something less than they can sell it for. And then they say, well, you have six months to come buy it back. Otherwise, we're selling it to somebody else. But in six months, I'll give you, um, maybe they give you $1,000. I'll give you, I'll, I'll take from you $900 to get it back. So you still have to pay a little. And so I was thinking about that example of the pawn shop. So Adam and Eve are standing in the garden. Jesus has given them the ring of authority. He's given them dominion rule over the earth. So he's, they've got the signet ring of authority to the earth. And, at, and, and Satan's basically saying, if you would like to pawn that, I will give you the knowledge of evil, and I will give you the ability to make decisions all for yourself. That's not a very good deal. <laughs> but they didn't know that, and so they exchanged the temporary for the eternal. And they turned in that ring, and it stayed there, because they weren't able to go buy it back. They had no ability to buy it back. And that ring, that bridal ring of authority, stayed in that pawn shop until Jesus came. And he came as a man. The only person that could go in that shop and pick up that ring was a man, a bridegroom man. <laughs> so he went into that pawn shop. He got that ring. And not only did he pay the price that was required to bring that ring out, he also paid above and beyond what that price was. So that would have been great. We could have just stopped there and we would have said, okay, trust Jesus, you can get to heaven. That would have been a great deal, right? But he went beyond that. He paid such a price that it made it possible for the Holy Spirit to come and live inside a man for the first time ever in all of creation. That had never happened before. So he paid such a price that it made us a clean vessel capable of hosting the Holy Spirit. Never before happened. And he began to plan a wedding. So he didn't just get the ring, and now he's planning a wedding. And now through the power of that Holy Spirit, he's transforming people who will do this, come boldly to him, naked, exposed, find out how he's living, find out how he's doing things. And the very life, remember in the video it said, those who eat of this tree are transformed by the life in it. So by that very tree, he is beginning to transform a people into his bride. So it's not, he didn't just pay for heaven. He paid for the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. He paid for the wedding. He paid for your life becoming into his likeness. He paid for you to become his bride. He paid for the wedding. He paid for the total annihilation of the enemy. I mean, he bought that thing back plus trillions, whatever that analogy looks like in your head. So that's what it means that he is our redeemer. And so we have the option now to make the choice because of Christ, because he became that tree of life, and because he went into the seed, or into the ground as a seed, he came up as this brand new thing that is available to man. And so we have to learn now how to live a different kind of human life than any other before Christ generation did. That is our privilege. And right now, in the seasons that we live in, we need to figure this out, right? We need to learn how to do this. So we need to understand what the obstacles are and what the inheritance is, what qualifies us, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next three weeks. Can anybody have any thoughts or questions? Yes.
journey, the goal of the journey of life is to be able to come back to the point of walking and talking with God with no fear. Yeah. What causes the um, trusting God? Yes, love, right? Did y'all hear that? Right. For us, that's what God wants us restored to. That is the tree of life, where we come naked and unafraid, fully exposed, able to talk with God, knowing that. We're not, we're clothed in the blood of Jesus. He sees, he looks at us, he sees Christ. And the same fellowship that they enjoy is for us. Anybody else? Questions, thoughts? Thank you for listening. Is there anything that has to be done in this room to prepare for? They'll get her done. They'll get her done? Okay. Okay. What? You got it? Okay. So, Father, I just thank you so much. We acknowledge that we often fall for the enemy's tactics because we don't understand what you have done on the cross through your burial, death, and resurrection. We don't understand how Christ qualifies us. And we get our eyes on what our five senses, our five natural senses, can see, hear, taste, feel, touch. And we don't understand how to access the tree of life. So, Father, we just thank you for teaching us about your perfect love, teaching us about your goodness, teaching us about these two kingdoms that we can live in, that we do live in, whether we realize it or not, we're living in them all the time, and how to access the kingdom of, of life, the kingdom of God. In every moment, as Carolyn Leaf would say, every seven seconds we're making a decision. That's exhausting, Lord. <laughs> we just want our default to be toward your goodness. So, Father, I thank you, and we just ask that um, over the coming week, you would just surprise us with just conversation. Let us begin, even today, to enter into a conversation with you, because that conversation is the tree of life. So, Father, I pray when a thought comes in their head that they're like, where did that come from? You will quicken them and awaken them to the realization, oh, that's God. He has something he wants to tell me right now. And just tune in and have those conversations. And I thank you, Lord. Release the Holy Spirit within them. Rise up, Holy Spirit, and begin revealing to us the tree of life. In Jesus' name, amen.